Hey there, it's Tom Corson Knowles, and welcome to the Publishing Profits Podcast Show. In today's show, I'm going to share with you a little preview of a talk that I'm going to be giving uh, this coming week in Portland at the Willamette Writers Conference. It's going to be a really big writers conference. I'm going to be giving two talks there, and this one is called The Ebook Revolution and the Future of Publishing. And as I'm preparing my lectures, preparing my slides now, and going over the data, uh, I've just found out some really fascinating stuff about you know the, how many books are being sold globally in the United States, on Amazon, in different markets, in different genres. Uh, and this data, this information is so, so important to understand as an author, as a publisher, because if you don't understand the numbers, it's hard to be successful. It's hard to know what to do and what not to do. You know, the, the more you know, the better decisions you're going to make, and the better decisions you're going to make, the, you know, the more you're going to earn, the happier you're going to be, the more success you're going to achieve in your life. So this data, this information is super, super, super important. And so this is kind of an abridged version of the talk that I'll be giving in Portland. I'll try to keep it, you know, not too long and go over the main highlights of the data and information and action steps that you can take uh, to apply this information to your life to improve your business as an author and as a publisher. All right, so let's get into it. So first of all, success is a numbers game. Like if you don't understand the numbers, you're just not going to understand what's happening out there, what's going on. And uh, again, the more you know, the better decisions you're going to make. And you don't need to memorize the numbers here. All you really need to do is just understand the big picture. If you if you just remember the big picture here of you know where ebooks are going, where audiobooks are going, where paperbacks are going, what genres are hot, what genres are really tiny and, and small markets. If you understand that stuff, just the basics, you'll do just fine. So you don't need to memorize the exact numbers of how many billions of dollars of sales there are. That's not what's important. What's important is that you understand the big picture and understand where the market's headed so that you can be in the right place at the right time. Okay, my story, we'll skip over this because I know a lot of you guys have heard my story before on the podcast show. If you haven't, you know, go back and listen to the other episodes. Okay, at TCK Publishing, our goal is to help every client earn a full-time income from royalties. And I'll be honest with you, when I started out uh, to the TCK Publishing, taking on publishing clients, I was really naive. I mean, I thought... You know, hey, anyone in any market, you could be successful because I've been successful and a lot of my clients have, and I know a lot of people that have. But, you know, when it came to, to doing things like publishing poetry or publishing children's books on Amazon, on Kindle and ebook format, it was it was incredibly hard to, to sell. You know, even more than a couple hundred copies a month was incredibly difficult in some of those really, really tiny markets. And so I realized, hey, look, I, gotta, I better go look at the market size, you know, do my research. Uh, and see what's going on here. You know, how come I can sell, you know, a thousand plus copies a month of a romance novel, but, you know, selling, you know, more than 50 or 100 copies a month of a, of a children's book is so darn difficult, right? It's because the market sizes are so incredibly different. I'm going to share that data with you in this talk, but I just want you to understand this is the kind of data that we use at TCK Publishing to make decisions. And uh, so this is not just some stuff that I put, cooked up you know, just for fun, this is data that I use in my own business. Okay, there are a few kind of caveats with the sales data I'm going to be sharing in this in this episode. First of all, it's not really comprehensive, and there are biased, like every, every study is biased, right? So, you know, some people who study the industry might only take data from, you know, Amazon or only from uh, Balkers or only from a certain market or a certain area. And uh, so just understand that, that, you know, the data isn't perfect, it's just how it is. The publishing industry is so complex and so vast and so big. I don't think anyone can really get perfect data across you know all markets and all genres and all distribution channels. And there's also going to be huge variations in sales and growth among different genres, different niches, and different countries. So just understand that uh, this isn't perfect data, but it's you know the best there is out there, and it's you know good enough to kind of get a view of the big picture and then understand what to do about it. So if you look at this chart, and by the way, if you want to see the slides for this show, uh, just go to publishingprofitspodcast.com and find this episode on there, and you'll see uh, a link to all the slides. So you can see all the slides if you want to, uh, but I'll try to explain everything for you. So if you're just listening and not looking at the slides, that's okay. So what I'm looking at right now is a chart of the ebook sales and physical book sales on Amazon from about 1996 to today. And what you'll notice is that when, when eBooks launched on Amazon and the Kindle in about 2009, sales took off almost immediately 
Within two years, by 2011, uh, ebook sales actually surpassed physical book sales on Amazon. So Amazon and, and now across the world, more ebooks are being sold than physical books. And uh, and the the thing is here that even though more ebooks are being sold, uh, the average price for an ebook is less than the average price for a physical book. So people are still spending far more money on physical books than on ebooks, uh, especially globally, but in the U.S. as well. But um, you know, but still, more ebooks are being sold, and the growth rate in ebooks is growing, while physical book sales are declining. And we'll talk about that as well. So, really, this is a next chart is, is a chart from PricewaterhouseCoopers. And they did a big study on uh, tablet ownership and how it's going to drive uh, digital revenue for ebooks and digital audiobooks. And uh, so, in the chart, basically, what's going to happen from now, 2000, 2014 to 2018, uh, the global sales for books, all ebooks, audiobooks, paperbacks, everything is about $60 billion a year, which is huge. It's a gigantic market. It's great. Uh, and the market's going to grow a little bit over the next you know, couple of years, not much, maybe a few billion dollars of growth by 2018. But what you'll notice is that uh, ebook revenue is going to double. So from 2013 to 2018, ebook revenue is going to double from about $10 billion a year, and now in 2014 to about $20 billion a year in 2018. So we're looking at a doubling of ebook revenue globally, and we're looking at a decline in uh, print sales, paperback, uh, and audio, well, sorry, physical book sales and audiobook sales, a decline of more than $10 billion uh, a year by 2018. That's a huge, huge, huge decline. In uh, print sales. Now, I'm not going to say this is the end of print. It's not. There's still going to be, you know, 40, 50 billion dollars a year in, in print sales globally. So it's still going to be a big market, but it's a market in decline and declining uh, pretty quickly. I mean, it's not declining like you know, uh, technology that becomes obsolete. Uh, it's not that kind of decline. It's just an industry that's in decline in general. Um, so uh, it's, you know, it's not some catastrophic loss that you know print sales are going to disappear. I don't think that's likely at all. But what is going to happen is that print sales are going to decrease by $10 billion or more over the next couple of years, and that's a huge loss. But it's going to be more than made up for in, in growth of ebooks. And really, the driver of this growth is tablet devices, you know, Kindle Fires, Kindle Readers, Nooks, um, you know, iPads, any kind of tablet device that people use to read ebooks is really going to drive digital growth. And so if you look at the tablet growth, from now it's going to be about uh, 500 million tablet devices right now that are active in 2014, and by 2018 it's going to tr more than triple to about 1,500 uh, tablet devices. So that is what's going to be driving the major growth in ebooks long term globally. And uh, and you know, the, again, these are just predictions from Pricewaterhouse Coopers that could be totally wrong. Um, but if anything, I would think that tablet devices might even grow faster than what they're predicting, and that could again lead to even more ebook growth. So if you look at the industry right now, print sales are declining globally. That's just how it's going to be. Ebook sales are still growing. That's just how it's going to be. So when you look at ebook growth, you can definitely tell that the year-on-year -year growth rate is declining in ebook growth. So you know, a couple years ago, ebooks were growing 20, 20 plus percent a year globally huge growth and in the US you know sometimes it was you know far more than that growth rate but globally it's still growing pretty quickly uh, this year maybe about six to eight percent growth globally uh, 2018 it might slow down to two or three percent globally uh, which is small I mean that's you know maybe the size of inflation uh, by that point um, but you know it is the only growth in the industry right I mean audiobook sales are growing as well but there's such a tiny market that it doesn't really compare in to terms of total revenue volume. But again, you know, ebook sales are going to probably double from about 10 billion this year to about 20 billion in 2018. That's a big increase in growth, right? It's a big, big increase in growth, and it's the only real growth in the industry because print sales are declining so rapidly. So, uh, you know, if you're a new author, that's where the growth is going to be in ebooks. Okay, and the big question a lot of authors have is, you know, should I write longer books or shorter books? Which ones sell better? And so uh, Smashwords did a study, and what they found was that you know if you look at the top top uh, you know ten books, the top ten bestsellers, um, there's the, the average page count is about 120,000 words, and the top 1,000 is average page count is about 73,000 words. And so basically the whole idea is here: look, best-selling books tend to be longer, therefore the longer your book, the better it's going to sell. 
Now, I think personally this only really applies to fiction because there's a few things biased about this. First of all, if you look at you know the top 100 books on Amazon uh, or any digital platform, it's going to be fiction. You know, 80, 90 percent, sometimes 100 percent fiction. So if you look at the top 100 books on Amazon, usually anywhere from five to 20 of those will be nonfiction. The rest is all going to be fiction. And so this uh, this particular study is kind of biased towards fiction. So I think it definitely applies to fiction. The longer your novels. I think the better they will sell in general. Um, it's not guaranteed. It's just kind of a it's just kind of a trending thing that readers like longer novels, they like trilogies and series and so forth. Um, but when it comes to nonfiction, I don't think that applies. So for nonfiction books, uh, you know, I don't think length is really a or word count is really a good measure of how well that book's going to sell. I think you know I've had lots of success with shorter books, you know, forty to one hundred forty pages, and I know a lot of other authors that have as well. For nonfiction, so uh, for nonfiction, I don't think length is really the most important part at all. But for fiction, length is definitely important. Um, and that doesn't mean you should pad your novels and you know double your word count just you know to have a longer novel. You know your book is done when it's done, your story is done when it's done. But if you look at you know the traditional publishing world, and you know, people want to uh, or agents and publishers, you know they have the certain rules for different genres. You know, sci-fi might be only seventy thousand to eighty-five thousand words or something like that. And you know, if your book doesn't fit in that tight that tight word count range, they're going to say, "Hey, you got to cut it down so it can fit into the norm for the market." But if you're self-published, you don't have to worry about that at all. And you'll notice that. So if you've got a hundred twenty thousand or hundred fifty thousand word, you know, novel, and you're self-published, go ahead and publish it. There's no one. You don't have to wait for an agent or publisher to say it's okay. And the market is saying, "Hey, we love we love these longer novels. Consumers are buying the longer novels." Uh, so that's what I recommend. If you're writing fiction, write longer novels if you can. Again, don't pad your word count, but don't be afraid of a longer novel. Uh, and if you're writing nonfiction, I wouldn't worry about word count so much. I don't think it's a huge driver of sales. Okay, when you look at author profits, uh, you know a, a self-published author can earn two dollars and six cents from a two ninety nine self-published ebook. Right, so that's your earnings. If you're a traditionally published author, you earn about the same, about two dollars from a twenty-five dollar uh, traditionally published hardcover book when you sell it. So, you know, what's easier to do: sell a two ninety-nine ebook or a twenty-five dollar hardcover book? I mean, it's obviously a lot easier to sell a a two ninety-nine ebook. So, um, this is why self-published authors can compete so well with the traditionally published authors, um, even with a lot less sales. Or with about the same sales at a much much lower price, a tenth of the price, you can still make as much or more as a traditionally published author. And you know, if you've watched the interview with you know Hugh Howey and some of the other self-published authors in the show, I think you understand. You know, you can definitely earn a lot a lot of money as a self-published author um, because you're earning so much more of the royalties when you sell a book. So when you look at you know self-publishing versus traditional publishing, this is huge. So this is a, a chart from AuthorEarnings.com. I uh, highly recommend you check out the site authorearnings.com, and it's just got tons and tons of awesome data on uh, you know everything about ebook sales and physical sales and just the uh, industry sales in general. So this chart's a little bit complicated, so I'll try to explain it. So basically, uh, there's a, a chart for ebook sales and print sales, and so for ebook sales, and, and we're comparing here now if you're a self-published versus traditionally published. So for ebooks, if you're traditionally published or self-published, you have the same distribution no matter what. So you're not really going to see uh, any gain or loss of sales, whether you're self-published or traditionally published. I mean, the only difference is going to be your marketing campaign. So, ebook sales are going to be the same regardless uh, in terms of total revenue and sales numbers. But print sales are going to be totally different. So, you know, if you're traditionally published, you're going to have distribution through Barnes and Nobles and, and retailers and all kinds of physical stores that you basically impossible to get or very difficult to get as a self-published author. And so, if you're uh, self-published, you're going to miss out on you know 90% plus of your print sales. So you're going to miss out on a ton of print sales as a self-published author. But when you look at the actual breakdown of royalties, because traditionally published authors only earn you know 10 to 25%, uh, when you combine the total earnings, uh, self-published versus traditionally published, you'll find that you know the self-published author is going to earn 50% to 100% more. Uh, and the and the reason is ebooks. It's all about ebooks because you know, self-published authors' income is going to be almost exclusively from ebooks. Print sales are going to be a very very tiny fraction. Uh, whereas traditionally published, you're still going to earn more more income from ebooks, 
than you are from print, but print is still gonna make up a pretty significant proportion. So maybe like 60, 40, 60% ebook, 40% print. Whereas if you're self-published, you're probably gonna do like 90% ebook, 10% print. And that's what I've seen with myself, my own sales, and a lot of our clients as well. So ebooks are where it's at, whether you're seriously published or not, um, you know, the vast majority of your income is gonna be from ebooks. And, but when you're self-published, you earn more of those, you keep more of those royalties from eBooks. And so this is why some authors are doing, you know, print only deals with traditional publishers, because it really doesn't make sense to do an eBook deal with a, with a traditional publisher. If you have a platform, if you've got a following, you know, if you've already had some kind of success as an author, um, giving away all those royalties for your eBooks, uh, it's just not a good business decision. You know, when you look at the data, it just doesn't make sense. So. This is a really profound chart. It's really amazing. And it's actually biased towards print. I mean, this chart is biased towards print um, because the way that they did the data. So, um, you know, so this, I think this, these numbers are, are underestimating uh, the effect of ebook sales and overestimating the effect of print sales because of the way they collected the data. Um, so, you know, you might even see more. Uh, you know, vastly more, like double the income as a self-published author than a traditionally published author, um, just because you're you're earning more from the from a bigger royalty split. So if you look at author earnings by genre or publisher, again, this is from uh, authorearnings.com. Uh, you'll see some really cool stuff about um, sales on Amazon. So first of all, uh, we're seeing about kind of a, a very good balance in the industry right now. So it's about you know a third of the sales estimated are from indie publishers, you know, about a third from small or medium publishers, about a third from big five publishers. That's kind of the breakdown. But when you look at by genre, it's a little bit different story. So for romance, it's like 66% uh, of the best-selling eBooks on Amazon are from indie published authors and only 18% from big five publishers. So romance right now is being dominated uh, by indie published authors on Amazon and it's also the biggest market by far. Uh, it's far bigger than mystery, thriller, and suspense combined. Uh, it's bigger than nonfiction uh, and, and it's almost two to three times the size of sci-fi sci and fantasy. So romance is a huge market right now and it's being just dominated by indie publishers. So it's the perfect time if you're a romance author to be indie published because um, you know many many romance authors are doing very very well. Uh, mystery thriller and suspense is actually dominated by big five publishers. It's uh, fifty four percent of the market on Amazon right now in terms of the best selling ebooks um, and about twenty three percent indie published. And mystery thriller suspense is, is a very big market. It's, it's about the same size as nonfiction. And the nonfiction is about a you know, pretty good split. You know thirty five percent big five publishers, thirty four percent medium publishers. 26% indie, um, so it's a pretty decent split in nonfiction right now, and it's, it's a big, big market as well. And then uh, sci-fi and fantasy is about half the size of nonfiction and half the size of mystery, thriller, and suspense, and it's also dominated by indie publishers, 56% versus 29% for big five published authors. And then you look at the tiny markets, so there's children's books, which I talked about before, very, very tiny market, very difficult uh, to do well with ebooks. And then literary fiction is also a very tiny market. And again, both of those tiny markets are dominated by the big five publishers. So it's just a really interesting data. Um, so these are the big markets. So if you want to be, you know, if you want to be in a big market where uh, where there's a potential to earn significant income, that would be romance, mystery, thriller, and suspense, major nonfiction markets like health, wellness, uh, you know, business and finances, you know, religion, spirituality. In relationships, those are the major nonfiction markets, uh, and then there's sci-fi and fantasy. It's also a pretty size, sizable market, and then there's the really tiny markets, which are children's books and literary fiction, which are very, very, very small markets in comparison. So, uh, you know, if you want to make big money, you probably got to be in a big market. It's very difficult to make big money, especially in eBooks and children's uh, and literary fiction. Okay, now if you look at the eBook bestsellers on Amazon, again, uh, it's just a really great balance. Um, you know. That's about a third, a third, a third, you know, a third indie published, a third uh, big five published, and a third smaller, medium published authors um, that are dominating the bestseller list on Amazon right now. So uh, it's, it's a surprising amount of balance right now in the industry. So if you look at my, my sales personally, uh, for my books, I've sold over 100,000 books in the last three years. Uh, Ebooks have accounted for about 89%. Uh, audiobooks are about 9%, and paperbacks are about 1% to 2%. Now, this is a little bit biased because I didn't start audiobooks until um, you know about six to eight months ago when I first started publishing audiobooks. So they audiobook sales have really taken off really fast for me, and I'm really happy with how they've done. 
Um, so overall, it's, I haven't sold 9% in, in audiobooks, but if you look at my monthly sales, it's about 9% audiobooks, 89% ebooks, and 1 to 2% paperback sales. So paperbacks are, are kind of a joke. I mean, uh, in terms of actually revenue and income, it's such a small percentage of my overall sales and, and revenue as a self-published author. You know, the vast majority of my income is coming from the ebook sales. And, uh, and that's pretty typical. I mean, across all the major markets, it's pretty typical for self-published authors to have a similar breakdown of sales. Um, so you can see that the data we showed before about ebook sales and ebook growth, you know, that's kind of how it works. Okay, and the question a lot of people ask is, you know, how much does it cost to self-publish a book? You know, anywhere from $5 to $5,000. You know, I published my first uh, ebook for $5. I went to Fiverr.com, got a $5 cover. I did all the formatting and the rest of the stuff myself. And if you want to learn how to do that, go to ebookpublishingschool.com and you can learn how to do the formatting and publish your book and self-publish it and all that basic stuff that goes into it. You know, when you're talking about the $5,000, that kind of range to self-publish, you're, you're looking at, you know, editors, multiple editors probably. Um, you're looking at, you know, some really fancy cover design. You're looking at, you know, ebook, audiobook, and paper book production. Uh, audiobook production can be pretty expensive, asking paperbacks sometimes. And uh, so those are the kind of the costs that go into it. Obviously, you can keep it as expensive or as cheap as you want. Um, I prefer to go a cheaper route. I don't want to spend you know five thousand dollars every time I publish a book, um, because you know you know the the less money you spend, the the more money you're going to keep. Okay, packaging. Packaging, I think, is going to be really crucial to uh, the future of the industry, uh, to the success uh, of anyone in selling eBooks. Uh, ebooks are a totally different beast than physical books. You know, when you're in Barnes and Nobles, you're shopping for a physical book, you can touch it, you can look at the cover, you can read inside. Uh, it's a totally different experience when you're shopping for an ebook online. Basically, readers only have three things to make a decision on. Number one is the title of your book. Number two is your cover. And number three is your book description. So you have to have a great title. And I, I talk about titles need to be memorable, repeatable, and searchable. So memorable, repeatable, and searchable. That means... Number one, it's got to be memorable. When someone hears the title of your book, they have to be able to remember it. Because the number one driver of sales for all books, no matter what kind of marketing you're doing, the number one driver for sales is going to be word of mouth. So if they can't remember the book, then that means they can't tell somebody else and, and the word of mouth won't spread. So once it's memorable, it has to be repeatable. And that means not only can they remember it, but they can share that message with a friend or family member or someone online and say, hey, go buy this book, Secrets of Six Figure Author, it's a great book. Um, so memorable, repeatable, and then searchable. If someone types that in online, they have to be able to find your book and then buy it. So if someone types in Secrets of the Six Figure Author on, online, they're going to find my book on Amazon. It's the first link in Google, and they can go ahead right there and buy it. So all titles need to be memorable, searchable, and repeatable. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard to get word of mouth. I mean, if people can't remember your title or can't find it online when they type it in, it's very hard to find your book and to get word of mouth sales. Number two is the cover. You got to have a good cover. Again, Fiverr.com, five bucks. You can you can get um, sometimes decent covers, sometimes really awful covers there. Um, but in my experience, uh, it's, it's kind of one of the best places to go if you really have no idea what you want for your cover and you want to get ten or twenty different comps, uh, to ten or twenty different mockups. You know, for a hundred bucks, you can get twenty different copy, uh, twenty different potential book covers. To check out on Fiverr.com, and uh, you know it's a pretty cool way to go. Uh, I don't use it use Fiverr very much anymore. I've got my own designers now that I really like that do great work. But um, you can get great covers for five dollars on Fiverr.com uh, if you're willing to put the time and effort and energy in there to find the right designer and uh, you know to keep going and to help them you know make changes, and updates if they need to. And then finally, the book description is key to packaging. Most authors mess this up. You know, Amazon gives you 600, 700 words for your book descriptions. Make sure you're using as much of it as you can to get more keywords in your descriptions and to let readers know what your book is about and help them make a good decision in order to purchase it. Okay, something new and big right now in the industry is called Kindle Unlimited. And Kindle Unlimited, if you haven't heard of it, uh, Amazon just launched it. It's uh, $9.99 a month for unlimited ebooks. And uh, basically, uh, if you have a Kindle reader, you can subscribe to Kindle Unlimited. 10 bucks a month, you get unlimited ebooks. They have over 600,000 titles right now in the program, which is huge. And you can have up to 10 books at a time on your device. So I actually love Kindle Unlimited. I got it right away. Uh, <laughs> I bought, you know, I went on this buying sprint and downloaded like 10 free ebooks right away. 
I tried to buy my 11th ebook and they said, hey, you can only have 10 at a time on your device. Uh, once you maxed out, you have to delete one and, and before you can borrow another one. And then how it works for authors is the author gets paid out of a big pool of money when customers read 10% or more of the book. So on Amazon, the look inside feature, anyone can read 10% of any book on any ebook on Amazon for free. The first 10% is free. If they read more than that uh, with your Kindle Unlimited book that they borrowed for free, um, then they can, then you will get paid out of a pool of money. So it's really similar to the Kindle owner's lending library. Uh, if you're in KDP Select, you know, uh, Amazon Prime members can borrow an ebook for free uh, once a month, and then you get paid about $2 and change out of a big pool of money. Um, so it's very similar to that. And, and basically, this is Amazon's response to, you know, Oyster and Scribd and some of the other ebook subscription services. Obviously, Amazon's going to win the battle here. I don't see any really other possible outcome here because Amazon just has such a huge database of customers and Kindles out there already and Kindle readers. So I think Amazon's definitely going to win the subscription game in ebooks for sure. Uh, they're already dominating the ebook market in the US and the UK and, and pretty much globally as well. So uh, it, it's interesting to see. I wonder how this will affect authors in the future. But overall, I think it's going to be a pretty decent thing. I mean, it's normal to have subscription services. Uh, you know, look at Netflix. It's where digital content is going to subscription services in a lot of places. But I think also there's a couple of reasons why uh, subscription services might not take over the industry entirely. I mean, I don't think, you know, five years from now, ten years from now, uh, Kindle Unlimited is not going to be the only source of revenue uh, for authors or for ebooks in general. I think a lot of people are still going to buy ebooks, uh, you know, outside of outside of uh, Kindle Unlimited program, and obviously people are still going to be buying print books and audiobooks as well. So it's not going to be, um, you know, a future where authors aren't getting paid, uh, you know, more than a few pennies for a book because they're all going to be free. That's not how it's going to work. I don't think. Um, but it's going to be an additional source of income for authors. And what is Kindle Unlimited is really going to do? It's going to help un uh, unknown authors reach more readers. You know, just like KDP Select used to have free promotions. I mean, they still have free promotions, but it used to be actually really profitable to run a free promotion. You know, a year, two years ago on Kindle, um, because if you did well in your free promotion. You know, as soon as your book came off free promotion, Amazon would promote it. And, you know, there are times when you earned, uh, when myself or clients would earn, you know, a thousand to ten thousand dollars in a week after a free promotion because the book just skyrocketed on the bestseller list. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. They totally changed the algorithms and how those free promotions work. But uh, I think this is kind of a similar concept where uh, it's free to the reader, but the author's getting paid. And so you're just getting more and more exposure and more readers. Um, uh, so I think it's good marketing for self-published authors, independent authors. It's good marketing to have at least one book in, in Kindle Unlimited to give readers a chance. Uh, and these are these are like high quality readers. I mean, anyone who pays 10 bucks a month for, for a subscription is not your average reader, right? They're not just someone who reads a book a year. Uh, these are people who read regularly and those are the kind of readers and fans you want to attract for your books. Whether you write nonfiction or fiction, it doesn't matter. You want active readers for your books. And I think Kindle Unlimited is going to be a great way for self-published authors to reach new readers. Uh, and the question is, you know, does free pay? So Smashwords uh, did a 2014 ebook study and showed that fiction series when the first book was free earned more money overall for the author than series where the first book was not free. So, you know, uh, if you have a trilogy or a series of, of books, um, for fiction authors, consider having either the first book free, or if you don't want to do that, consider enrolling the first book in KDP Select, and that way you'll have access to the Kindle Unlimited uh, readers, and you can get a ton of free downloads from Kindle Unlimited, and then uh, those readers would then have to pay for books two and three or, or other books in your series. Uh, I think that could be a really good strategy, a really strong strategy. So you're not going to devalue your series by having the first book be free, but you're still going to get a whole bunch of readers as well. So I would definitely recommend testing that out for novelists. Um, if you're just starting out and you don't have an audience, either have your first book be free or have it in KDP Select so that uh, Kindle Unlimited, Unlimited readers can download it for free. And then another issue in the industry is going to be piracy. Um, you know, there's been studies that show that piracies can definitely help sales of new and unknown authors, but also tends to hurt sales of really established mainstream authors. So, you know, look at, you know, J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter, 
piracy is probably hurting their sales quite a bit. Um, but you know, if you look at someone like uh, you know me or some some smaller authors who only sell you know maybe ten or a hundred or thousands of books a month, um, we're still not famous. You know, we're still not earning millions of dollars from our books. But I think piracy can help a lot of authors like us who are smaller um, because it helps you just get more exposure and more readers in the first place. So even if they're not paying for your content, the word of mouth, again, is the number one reason books sell. So if someone you know, pirates your book and loves it and shares it with people and they go ahead online and buy it, that's how piracy can help increase your sales. And studies have shown that it actually does do that for new and unknown authors. I think one thing we can all agree on uh, uh, universally, well, I wouldn't say universally, but a lot of authors, self-published authors agree on is that DRM uh, is not working, digital rights management, it's just not working. Most savvy self-published authors choose not to use DRM at all, and uh, it's not an effective uh, deterrent for piracy at all because, you know, you can just Google how to hack DRM, and any base, anyone with basic computer skills can hack DRM in, in, you know, in, an, hour, in an hour or less just by doing your research online. Uh, there's lots of articles that will show you how to do it. So DRM is not working. It can easily be hacked. It's not a deterrent for hackers or pirates. It is a deterrent for you know my grandma who just wants to share the book uh, with a friend or family member. So DRM is not working. I'm not really sure. I mean, I don't, I'm not the. I don't have a perfect solution for how to fix DRM or how to end piracy or uh, fix these issues. But it's definitely an issue going forward. Um, I think you know services like Kindle Unlimited will kind of decrease piracy to some extent because the easier you make content uh, to access the, you know the, the less reason people have to pirate it you know look, look at like Netflix I'm pretty sure Netflix and Amazon instant video have led to a decrease in piracy um, because you know if you can just watch whatever you want or, uh, on Netflix and on Amazon um, if you're an Amazon Prime member uh, you know what's the point of pirating stuff? You, you can get it, you know, legitimately through a subscription service, and I think Kindle Unlimited is going to really help the industry in terms of reducing piracy long term. So that's it for the talk today. Hope it's been helpful for you. Uh, hope you got some good notes out of this. Again, if you want to check out the slides and look at all the visuals, go to publishingprofitspodcast.com. Find this episode on there, and there'll be a link to the slides and to the video as well. So I uh, hope this has been helpful for you. Wishing you an incredible day. I'll see you next week. Take care.